our comments and then announce. Uh, I'm trying to organize snorkeling in the marine reserve in front of the castle. Uh, the World Wildlife Foundation runs, provides gear and things like that. Uh, so I was thinking of trying to do that Friday afternoon. We need at least six people for them to come out with the gear and all those things. Uh, and it's 20 euro per person, and I, I think they show up with a guide and all sorts of things. So if anyone else is interested, I was thinking, I don't know, after this is over, so 2 o'clock or something like that, uh, just send me an email or grab me a coffee and, uh, and I'll get it all set up. Thanks. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, whose name I can't pronounce. He keeps correcting me and I keep getting it wrong, so here goes. Uh, Kaylin Vasigian, who's going to tell us about evolutionary dynamics of communities of antibiotic producing bacteria. Thanks, Peter. Well, it's, it was better, not perfect, but uh, B. <laughs> it's Kaylin Vasigian. Um, do you hear me well? Is this thing on? Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank Daniel and uh, Simon for inviting me, and also to all the other organizers, Matteo, Vittorio, and Panjun for putting this incredible experience uh, together. Now, I would like to honor the place we're in, which is the Center for Theoretical Physics. So in my talk, just like in the last talk, uh, uh, yesterday, I will emphasize more theory, and I also sprinkle it a little bit with uh, physics uh, way of thinking uh, along the way. Okay, so let's see if this is working. Not, oh. It used to work. I don't know. I'll just maybe use this. Ah, okay, it's working now, it's working, yeah. Okay, so the story uh, I'm going to tell you about started by thinking about extremely diverse environments such as soil, where people say that you can have 10,000, some people are gonna say 40,000 species in a single teaspoon of soil, okay? And I want to think about how diversity is generated and maintained in environments like that. Okay, now, uh, now there are at least two big uh, potential classes of explanations for diversity. The first type of explanation is that environments such as soil are heterogeneous down to small spatial scales, okay? Uh, and therefore, you have many different abiotic uh, niches there, and correspondingly, they harbor many, many uh, different uh, species, okay? So basically, the diversity is, is driven by environmental heterogeneity. The second type of explanation, which is not mutually exclusive, is that the diversity is somehow maintained through a network of pairwise, uh, or not pairwise, the network, uh, some kind, kind of web of uh, interactions, okay? Why do you leave out the other sources of, of biology? Uh, Yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about, about that. Uh, we're going to consider kind of the heterogeneity created by the microbes. Because I'm kind of... Uh, uh, I'm saying heterogeneity that might be created by uh, other host organisms. Yes, yeah, so I said at least uh, two uh, uh, explanations. There are other uh, uh, types of categories, but one obvious one is that uh, kind of there's some environmental gradient, right? It's not like a big puzzle why the power bears and the grizzly bears coexist, because they, there's, they inhabit uh, different environments. But uh, yeah, so this, this is not a full list of uh, explanations, right? So microbes, uh, uh, organisms create niches for other organisms. Are we doing well? Maybe I'll restart. Oh, now it's working, perfect. Okay, so uh, doing theory, you cannot weigh the relative importance of uh, these potential explanations, but what one can do is kind of ask, is this second type of explanation where the interactions maintain diversity is even uh, plausible? 
does it uh, make sense? Is it self-consistent? And if it does, kind of offer some particular mechanisms by which this can happen beyond uh, simple hand waving. Okay, now we're going to focus on this uh, second uh, uh, category in order to eliminate the first uh, types of uh, explanations. We're going to ask, can we get emergent diversity in one niche environments? And for the purposes of this talk, what I mean by one niche environment is, uh, let's say, single food source, no abiotic, spatial heterogeneity, though we can, might have an emergent biotic uh, heterogeneity, okay? And basically, we're going to ask whether the situation where we have one species per one niche is evolutionally unstable with respect to emergence of some diversity, okay? Now, why would that be? Well, one reason this might happen, as it was discussed yesterday, actually, is that microbes do not simply occupy niches created by uh, someone by God, uh, but they actually actively remodel their environment, okay? And in this way, they create niches for other microbes. And kind of the primary way in which microbes do that is by secreting or removing uh, bioactive uh, um, uh, uh, molecules uh, 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 from the environment, okay? Now, all microbes do that because at the very minimum they need to eat and they need to secrete waste products. And uh, as it was mentioned yesterday, waste product secretion already gives us one mechanism for coexistence, which is cross-feeding, okay? It is a very well uh, known mechanism, but perhaps what is slightly uh, less appreciated is the extent to which you can get diversity through cross-feeding, and I think this is uh, the subject of the next talk. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to eliminate this uh, known explanation. I'm going to shoot myself in the leg and say, uh, let's imagine that waste products are just waste products and everyone is just eating the same food. Can we still have a diversity that's uh, uh, coexisting here, stably in that environment, okay? And the reason I'm interested in that question is because many microbes uh, invest heavily into the production secretion of uh, bioactive small molecules such as antibiotics, such as aderophores, quorum sensing molecules, uh, and so on. Now, we know quite a lot about the chemical structure of these molecules, how they're produced, how they act, but we're not very good at understanding their ecological and evolutionary consequences, okay? And it's hard for several simple reasons. First of all, the effect of uh, small molecules is kind of uh, context dependent. Simple example, antibiotic production might be beneficial if there are sensitive bacteria around, but it will be just a waste of resources and energy if there are only resistant bacteria around, okay? And perhaps because uh, this benefit is context dependent, many microbes have, have uh, evolved the capability to produce many different uh, antibiotic-like molecules, okay? In some cases, up to 70 different molecules, okay? So what you see here, Is, is, is basically for uh, actinobacteria, how many uh, biosynthetic gene clusters uh, they have for things like, say, derophores and antibiotics. You see sometimes it goes up to, uh, up to 70, typically around uh, 20, okay? And uh, kind of, uh, so that's an extra complication. And the final in uh, ingredient the, that makes the dynamics very interesting for me is that these small molecules mediate ecological interactions, and these interactions can evolve really fast through several different mechanisms. I just told you that uh, microbes can produce many different small molecules, they call that the capability, but they don't, they don't make them all at the same time. So simple regulatory changes, for example, can change the subset or quantities of molecules uh, you produce, right, which, of, which antibiotics you make. Also, the response of uh, bacteria to small molecules can easily evolve with antibiotic resistance being a famous uh, example of that. And finally, both production and resistance are very modular uh, genetic uh, traits, so they can move uh, very easily through horizontal gene transfer, okay? So to summarize what I've uh, been telling you so far, we have systems where we have strong ecological interactions these ecological interactions can evolve fast, okay? 
And uh, this goes to the heart of the problem I think we have with understanding microbial communities in general, this coupling between ecology and evolution. How do we think about it? Okay, I kind of, uh, when I think about ecology, even though it's very complicated, I have this picture of a nonlinear dynamical system with some fixed dimensionality, and you have some expectation that uh, these trajectories can either reach a fixed point or maybe exhibit oscillations or maybe deterministic chaos or something like that. But when you add evolution, then it becomes very confusing because what do you do every time a new strain emerges? Do you add a new dimension every time a strain ex gets extinct? It's, it's very unclear how to think about eco-evolution, okay? So this talk has kind of two themes. One is uh, diversity, which is how I got started. And then the second theme is eco-evolution dynamics, which is kind of uh, the way things evolved and kind of what's uh, most exciting for me uh, right now. All right, so within this setup, we're focusing exclusively on antibiotic interactions, and we can ask questions on two levels. The first uh, level is uh, entirely ecological level, and this is uh, work that I did with uh, uh, Roy uh, Kishoni and the student, uh, graduate student uh, Eric uh, Kelsik. And uh, in that part, we focus on the question, can we construct communities, kind of uh, in silico, uh, where diversity is maintained, uh, where diversity between uh, organisms that have different antibiotic production and resistance capabilities is maintained in these one niche environments, okay? And then we will add evolution to the picture and ask if we can construct such communities, does diversity emerge spontaneously if you allow microbes kind of in a natural way to evolve their production and resistance capabilities, okay? So, first of all, it's not at all obvious that antibiotic interactions help diversity. So, it was not until 1997 that a mechanism was proposed for how this might even happen. And in fact, the person that proposed it is uh, Simon uh, Levin, and he also mentioned it uh, in his talk. And he, in his talk, he also kind of uh, acknowledged the contribution from Bruce, who previously studied uh, combinations of producers and sensitive uh, 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 communities of producers and sensitive bacteria and compared liquid uh, versus uh, 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 solid uh, media. So kind of I might summarize this by saying that Simon Levin standing on the shoulders of giant Bruce Levin kind of uh, 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 recognized that uh, uh, antibiotics kind of naturally, very naturally lead to rock, paper, scissors games. Okay, and the way this works is uh, uh, pr the producer uh, kills the sensitive bacteria, the sensitive bacteria outcompetes the resistant because of cost of resistance, and then the resistant bacteria outcompete the pr producer because of cost of uh, production. So this leads to uh, diversity, but the way this works is uh, it only works in spatial setting, and basically you have these different uh, uh, single species patches that uh, start chasing uh, around, like the scissors uh, chase the papers, and the papers chase the rocks, and you have these beautiful spiral waves. waves. But as Simon uh, and uh, other people later realized, this only works if spatial structure is very carefully uh, well preserved. As soon as you start introducing uh, kind of uh, microbial uh, diffusion or uh, microbial dispersal, uh, diversity collapses, okay? So this kind of limits the utility, or it apparently limits this, uh, the utility of this mechanism for explaining uh, natural diversity. In soil, for example, uh, if dispersal is high, yes. Uh, and in soil, for example, these antibiotic producing bacteria that we work in the lab, their uh, spore forming, their hydrophobic spores, every time it rains, these spores will be carried uh, at large distances. So even if spatial structure is preserved temporarily, in the long run, over the course of tens of years, uh, it, will, it will be uh, a bit scrambled, okay? So this leaves us with this uh, more uh, pointed question, which is can we have diversity without uh, perfectly preserving uh, spatial structure at all times, okay? And kind of uh, the way uh, we made uh, progress with that question, the insight came from an experiment I did with uh, Eric where uh, we looked at higher order interactions in bacteria. And what we discovered is that among uh, bacteria from the genus uh, Streptomyces at least, 
Antibiotic degradation is a very common higher order interaction. So basically, uh, uh, many bacteria uh, degrade, the, uh, uh, degrade antibiotics. And, and uh, this is ecologically interesting because this antibiotic degradation mediates higher order interaction. The degrader cross protects the sensitive uh, bacteria from the antibiotics. So sensitive bacteria can survive near an antibiotic producer if there is also an antibiotic degrading bacteria near it, okay? So we put this uh, in a very uh, simple uh, mathematical uh, model. And uh, basically, we have different uh, uh, strains with different phenotypes. We put them on a plate. The producers secrete antibiotics in a certain neighborhood. Degraders destroy antibiotics in a certain neighborhood. If there are sensitive bacteria covered by antibiotics, they get killed. And finally, we kind of uh, collect all the spores from this uh, virtual plate, mix them up, dilute, and plate again, okay? And uh, so uh, we work with this perfect mixing limit, and the reason we do that is that's because this is the most interesting limit from a theoretical perspective given this limitation that I uh, explained to you, okay? And also thinking ahead about experiments, it's a very natural way to do experiments. You plate spores on a plate, then you collect them, and so on. Okay, so to make a very long uh, story here, short, what we discovered is that if you add this extra ingredient, antibiotic uh, degradation, rather than just a regular uh, resistance, we can, in fact, construct stable coexisting uh, communities where the strains only differ in their antibiotic production and resistance capability and eat the same food. Whereas, if we have uh, just pairwise inhibitory interactions without cross protection, we can never construct uh, such communities. No matter how we play with interaction not network, no matter how we adjust the growth rates. And uh, when I presented this kind of, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, Jeff Gore made uh, this comment that, well, it's, uh, there definitely, it's definitely possible to have stable coexistence with just pairwise rock, paper, scissor games. And while this is in general true, kind of the constraint we have here is that we're ignoring uh, the possibility of predator-prey interactions. Basically, we assume that the producer and the sensitive bacteria, they eat the same resource, they compete for the same resource. So the producer bacteria is not better off if there are sensitive bacteria around. So no single strain is bringing extra resources to the table, okay? Uh, so within this constraint, kind of this uh, uh, statement is, uh, is true, okay? It's uh, impossible with these pairwise interactions only to have these stable communities, okay? And uh, this uh, here is shown just uh, one example of a kind of nicely symmetric uh, community with three inhibitions and, uh, and degradation interaction shown on dashed lines. As you can see here, what this triangle shows is that if you mix the species in many different abundances, the dynamics nicely flows to a stable fixed point uh, here so there is a big basin of attraction for uh, that particular community. And kind of the other nice thing is that if you start playing with the growth rates, the relative growth rates of the species, this mechanism is robust to big changes in growth rates. We can have coexistence even for like tenfold differences in uh, the growth rate between microbes, which is kind of huge for microbes, like one microbe growing 10 times faster than the other. All right, so one thing that will be relevant uh, uh, in a little bit is that kind of the simplest uh, uh, community that uh, we could construct within this framework uh, maintains coexistence between three species on two antibiotics, and all the resistance is coming from antibiotic degradation, okay? And kind of just to uh, uh, connect to, with what Jeff Gore was uh, saying uh, uh, yesterday about these three different types of pairwise interactions, dominance, by stability, coexistence, it turns out that even though we kind of started with this picture of rock, paper, scissor games. These communities that we find are in fact not like classical rock, paper, scissor games where you have three dominance interactions uh, in a line, but they are what I would call conditional rock, paper, scissor game. We have dominance here, dominance here, but this is kind of uh, by stability. And in fact, one can prove mathematically that you, have, uh, you need to have at least one by stability for these communities uh, to work, okay? All right. So, we're super excited about uh, uh, this result, but there were a few outstanding uh, issues that uh, 
I wanted to address before kind of fully embracing this mechanism as a viable option for explaining diversity in uh, natural environments. Kind of the first limitation is that as you try to construct bigger and bigger communities, it gets increasingly harder to choose parameters that uh, have coexistence. So it's not at all obvious that evolution spontaneously will find these strange uh, communities uh, that coexist, okay? So that's kind of the, the big question, if we, let, uh, would, uh, if we let evolution naturally happen, what, uh, whether it will find these communities. And finally, kind of this model that I showed, it's very stylized, and that, that's by design, you want it, to, want it to be very simple. But there is always a danger that if you simplify too much, maybe what you see is an artifact of uh, some simplification. So we wanted to add realism, stuff that we know uh, is happening from our experiments in the lab and see if uh, the mechanism of uh, maintaining diversity through antibiotic production and degradation will still work if we add some realism. Okay, so kind of uh, one of the realistic uh, features we uh, added was uh, the life cycle of uh, streptomyces. So they start as pores, these pores germinate, they form mycelium colonies, and uh, as resources get exhausted, they uh, sporulate, okay? And here at the onset of sporulation, they usually flood the area with antibiotics, and that's because uh, what feeds the sporulation process is that mycelium commits suicide, uh, and the released resources uh, are used to, uh, to build the spores, okay? So they're not as smart as fungi, maybe, to kind of internally incorporate these resources. They, the resources leak out uh, into the environment through this. Uh, so it's kind of a protection uh, mechanism. You don't want someone else, your neighbor, to steal your resources. So there are three essential features. There is growth, there is antibiotic production, and then there is a sporulation phase. Okay, and uh, here is how uh, it might work in a simulation. You scatter some spores on your virtual uh, Petri dish. The colonies grow, and they crash into each other. And by the way, uh, in, uh, in this way of doing things, basically the biomass you get per colony is exactly uh, uh, what uh, Will was saying. It corresponds to exactly to the, well, what is it called, the uh, Voronoi uh, uh, tessellation. And then, Different uh, uh, colonies have different properties. So what's shown here in red, red contours are antibiotic producer colonies. So they produce antibiotic, they start diffusing. What is shown here in cyan are antibiotic degrading colonies. They start degrading colonies. And kind of uh, over time, you start getting uh, these many different micro environments, uh, okay? Just because of the randomness of who, 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 who is neighbor uh, to whom. And then, uh, at some point, you have a sporulation phase. Uh, basically, uh, what uh, uh, we assume that uh, if there are too many antibiotics, you die, and then there is higher uh, sporulation if your neighbor uh, is dead, okay? Basically, your neighbor cannot steal your, your resources. Maybe if you kill that uh, neighbor, maybe you steal some of uh, uh, his resources. And that's actually an actual feature you see on Petri dishes. If you have a zone inhibition, usually around the edge of the zone inhibition, you, you see better growth and better sporulation. Okay, so this is where the benefit of inhibition comes in. This is where, uh, how it inhibition pays off in the model. And uh, that's kind of important because for evolution, you need an immediate benefit of uh, inhibition, okay? Uh, yeah, so each colony, uh, secretes uh, antibiotics. This antibiotic starts to diffuse away, just, just regular diffusion. Then uh, uh, degrading colonies, they act, add, add as, uh, act as a sink to the antibiotic. They just destroy the antibiotics. I don't assume that the antibiotic destruction thing uh, diffuses away. It's just like the colonies uh, start destroying antibiotics. Then you assume that there is like a standard uh, zone of uh, uh, a standard response curve So if this is the, the antibiotic concentration, and this is kind of log survival. So there is something like the analog of MIC, if you want, in our model. And after that, there is an exponential decrease in the probability to survive per unit time. And that's, uh, that's it. And then after some time, we just said, OK, and now we're done with that. Now we're going to do sporulation, and you sporulate proportional to uh, how much live cells you have. But there are also this, uh, uh, but then uh, you assume that there are this background of resources created 
from dying mycelium or from killed bacteria, and these resources start diffusing. Okay? So, no, it's by antibiotics that, that are produced by the producer colonies. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. We can talk a bit uh, more later. Yeah, the antibiotics usually are degraded by enzymes, and there are two options. Either the enzyme is diffusing, or it is linked to the surface. I'm kind of assuming it's linked to the surface, so it, uh, what's degrading the enzymes is not freely diffusing. It's kind of the more conservative assumption if you... So the antibiotics diffuse, and so do the degrading enzymes. No, the degrading enzymes stay st stuck to the cell wall oh, okay. of, the, of, uh, of the bacteria that degrade them. At least in this model. I mean, it's, you can easily change that with one line of code. Okay, and kind of most importantly, you can add evolution. And to do evolution properly, we kind of go beyond these discrete phenotypes, degrader, sensitive, resistant, producer, and kind of assume uh, continuous possibilities of different phenotypes. In particular, uh, you assume that you can adjust your level of antibiotic degradation continuously. You can adjust your level of antibiotic production continuously, and we know the gene regulation can do uh, this thing, so it's a very natural assumption. And kind of on this branch here, we assume that uh, on the blue branch, bacteria also equipped an efflux pump, which is kind of to simplify things and, don't and, do, uh, and not introduce an extra dimension. We assume that the efflux pump uh, kind of uh, is feedback regulated and automatically brings the concentration uh, up to this point to avoid uh, any inhibition, okay? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 yes, I deliberately uh, uh, assume that just because that allows me to have a one dimension per antibiotic. Otherwise, I have more dimensions and it becomes more complicated. But we assume that you cannot, for example, produce and degrade antibiotics. You cannot have an efflux pump and be degraded. That's simply to reduce the complexity of the problem. But uh, you agree now that we have some interesting stuff in the next thing. I can relax this and see, oh, is this all this good thing still working if I relax that assumption? I haven't done that. Okay, and uh, uh, so we have this, uh, in, the, in these simulations we work with either one or two antibiotics, and then you have a, uh, each point in this uh, space uh, is kind of a possible strain, and then we assume that we can have mutations that can either tweak the phenotype with respect to one antibiotic or kind of drastically change the phenotype, and I showed you in the beginning some mechanisms through which that might happen. For example, to jump from here to here, maybe you can turn on a silent uh, antibiotic cluster, or you can acquire antibiotic from uh, someone else. And in such low dimensionality, it actually doesn't matter what the mechanism actually is. What we assume is it's easy to make small changes and it's easy to make uh, big changes of uh, antibiotic production and degradation. And in this simulation, we start with a single strain that's sensitive to all the antibiotics. Okay, and then we just run thousands of different simulations with different costs of production and uh, resistance. Uh, and so on, and see what happens. So let's start with the one antibiotic uh, case. So we have a single uh, phenotypic uh, dimension here. So this is the space of possible phenotypes. And we also kind of color coded them. All the producers are magenta, all the degraders are green, the sensitive limit is uh, black. We have resistance in blue. And we run for, let's say, 30,000 ecological cycles. And I kind of zoomed into the first 500 cycles because uh, things happen uh, fast. And what you see here, what I want you to see is that kind of very quickly, in a matter of, let's say, hundred, few hundred ecological cycles, you get these three species communities forming. So it's a three species communities between a producer strain, a sensitive strain, and a degrader strain. So it's uh, like a, a community that Simon proposes, but instead of a resistance strain, you have a degrader strain. But now it's spontaneously emerging. Okay, and moreover, its evolution, its evolution is stable state. And what I mean by that, I mean it's ecologically stable. If I turn off mutations, it will persist indefinitely. And you can see the nature of the attractor here. And uh, second of all, no mutations exist that can destroy the community. Actually, in practice, what happens is even after a while, you can have fine-tuning mutations here. One producer dies off, another comes in. So the community keeps fine-tuning itself very, very slowly after a time. 
but uh, uh, it, it's stable. So this is like a Nash equilibrium between three species that emerges and persist, okay? And it kind of snaps out of uh, nothing. Uh, now, uh, uh, first of all, see that uh, uh, kind of in what I showed you before with the simpler model, we, have, we had, we, we required two antibiotics minimally to maintain three strains. Here, we have uh, coexistence with only one antibiotic of three strains, which is emerging uh, uh, spontaneously. But kind of, uh, if, we, if we focus on just on the pairwise interactions again, we uh, see the same pattern. We have a dominance interaction, a dominance interaction, then we have this bistable interaction. And this bistability just emerges. I mean, it's not for any values of production degradation you have bistability, just that wherever we see this evolutionary stable state emerging, you also, also always see this, this, this bistability. And you can understand it because both pro antibiotic production and degradation, they're like cooperative mechanisms in, in this model. Okay, you might be a lone producer and that might be insufficient to inhibit the degrader, but maybe if you there are five producers surrounding a degrader, they can kill it similarly with degradation. Like a lone deg degrader might not be strong enough to protect itself, but if there are many other degraders, that might help them, okay? So uh, again, uh, well, we don't have a classical rock, paper, scissor game. We have for this kind of conditional. Uh, uh, yeah, Roy. Uh, yeah, there is a, uh, uh, is there a cost of production? Yeah, we assume that the, the more you degrade, there is a, a, a linear cost of degradation. There is a linear cost of production. We also imagine there is a cost of uh, having this efflux uh, uh, pump mechanism. Another cost we have is an operational cost for the efflux. So resistance in this model, if you have an efflux pump, is not just like a constant genetically encoded. It depends on the antibiotic concentration of the, the environment. Kind of basically what you assume is that, uh, so if this is a cell and there is some uh, efflux pump, so this is the outside antibiotic concentration. This is the inside concentration. So we imagine that you uh, expand some energy, which is proportional to some constant time to, and this, by the way, the inside concentration we assume goes to whatever uh, is uh, uh, non-inhibitory. So, so basically you have this operational cost uh, for uh, the efflux pump. And we, uh, all these costs, all these different costs are parameters to the model, and we Uh, yes, yes, that's uh, uh, of, of course true. Yeah, if you have a compensatory mutation, for example, you cannot get stability. But I mean, every if, if for example, the ability, uh, uh, the possibility of compensatory mutations exists, obviously every antibiotic will get absolute over time, and you never get an evolutionary stable community, right? So it's very important. And actually, I think Martin also has in, in, in his talk later he will discuss situations where maybe there, there might not even be a cost to production and stuff like that. We assume there is cost to resistance. We assume there is cost of production here. All right. So uh, kind of uh, uh, to connect a little bit again with what uh, Jeff was uh, telling yesterday about no rock, paper, scissor games existing and so on, I decided to show you a bit of our data. So we did many experiments similar to Jeff's where we mix uh, many uh, streptomyces in the lab and propagate them just kind of on petri uh, uh, dishes and uh, uh, monitor the outcome. And unlike uh, his uh, collection of strains, this random soil antibiotic producing bacteria from the genus streptomyces, they very often exhibit bistability. You can see it, for example, here. You can see it here. It's kind of very striking. You put one strain at 60%, the other at 40, it wins, then you flip it, the other strain wins. But then, just by trying few random triangles, three combination strains, you already can see that kind of this dominance, dominance, bistability, this weak uh, 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 or conditional rock, paper, scissor game already emerging in terms of the pairwise interactions. And just like Jeff, we never see this dominance, 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 rock, paper, scissor rock game. So obviously here in this community that we see, the higher order interactions are not correct to see coexistence, but at least looking at the pairwise interactions, there is nothing that discourages us from thinking that there is something wrong about our way of thinking. All right. Now we can uh, do two antibiotics, and uh, here is what you see now. With two antibiotics, uh, you have a two-dimensional space. We plate it, uh, we look at it over time. These are the strains above 0.1%. And very, very quickly, actually, you cannot even see it on this time scale, five species 
evolutionary stable state emerges, okay? You can see how it emerges again in a matter of a few hundred generations, and then it stays on, and kind of we have cover all the different phenotypes to help us look at this, and you see some selective sweeps keep going, this community uh, uh, refines further and further, but it, this is an evolutionary stable state. Once it forms, it stays there forever. There are no mutants that can exist. So it's an example of Nash equilibrium, uh, evolutionary Nash equilibrium that emerges very, very quickly and kind of uh, snaps. So again, uh, the, uh, the, the, this, uh, this is the kind of complexity which is much higher than what we've been seeing in this much simpler model when we were trying to manually construct communities. Here we get much greater complexity for free. All right, and uh, uh, with uh, the single antibiotic, there was a single evolutionary stable state of the type I showed you here. We have two different types of evolutionary stable states for different parameters, so there's no bi-stability. Just like for one set of parameters, we get uh, this uh, type of community. For others, we get this type of community. And just to orient you a bit, here we have an antibiotic producer to one antibiotic, anti anti uh, production of another antibiotic, degradation of one antibiotic, degradation of the other antibiotic, and this is kind of a double sensitive uh, strain. For other parameters, we have the same thing, but instead of a double sensitive strain, we have a double degrader here. And there is some kind of modularity to this community. If I take these three strains with one antibiotic, they form again this producer sensitive degrader. This is ecologically stable. It's not evolutionally stable, obviously, but it's ecologically stable. This is also ecologically stable. So we have this uh, kind of one antibiotic modules that stuck together uh, somehow. Uh, to make this uh, bigger communities. And you can keep going, like with three antibiotics, we, we can see seven, uh, seven species coexisting. Uh, okay, so uh, for the rest, I want to simplify kind of our, uh, our notation. So instead of having these two dimension, three dimensional diagrams of phenotypes over time, I'll project the phenotypes into one dimension like that, and then we're going to look at phenotypes in some abstract space versus uh, ecological cycle, and you can look at what happens with the different lineages, okay? So, first of all, to summarize what I've shown you so far, so far I've shown you that we have emergent diversity in one niche environments. If we allow the bacteria to freely evolve their investment with antibiotic production and antibiotic degradation in kind of a, a, a realistic uh, uh, multi-scale uh, model, and moreover, the types of communities we see are kind of uh, more complex than the, uh, than the ones we were seeing initially. So adding uh, realism and adding evolution not only didn't hurt our mechanism, in fact, uh, it made it work uh, better. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this is kind of what we were hoping uh, to see. That's why I started the project, looking at diversity. But then when I started looking at the data for many different parameters, many different costs of production resistance, and looking at these kind of diagrams, uh, something struck me, and what struck me is that as we change the parameters, there are, uh, there are several uh, different types of patterns uh, that you start to see. I call them different modes of the eco-evolutionary dynamics. So what I've shown you so far are the evolutionary stable states, which we kind of know and love and uh, know how to think about them, but there are several other uh, eco, eco modes, and I'll go through them right now. One of them, uh, is uh, what we call rapid turnover, or uh, red queen dynamics. There, you have diversity at every point in time, but you don't have evolution instability ever. So the, uh, so the community keeps changing and changing and changing. No single strain, as you see, there are no straight lines here. No single strain persists for very long. So we call it red queen because you need to keep evolving in order to survive. No one that doesn't evolve survives for very long, okay? The next thing is kind of if you look in between the evolutionary stable state and this uh, rapid turnover state, a striking pattern we see is intermittency, okay? So we see this uh, uh, kind of apparently stable communities that survive for thousands of generations, kind of of the safe, same type as the evolutionary stable communities, five species community, and then suddenly this community would collapse. Then you have random rapid turnover for a while uh, then you will get a kind of stable community that survives for a long time again. And here is another example. We just see it over and over and over again, and this is a particularly striking, beautiful example of it. You see the community, there are some selective sweeps happening within that community, and finally it collapses. Then it's random, 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 
finally it hits into another community, then it collapses again, okay? So we call this uh, intermittency, okay? So we have two qualitatively different regimes with very different statistical properties that persist for long times, thousands of generations, and sometimes switch from one to another, okay? And I call it intermittency because uh, that's kind of a famous uh, phenomenon in physics, in particular in the con context of turbulence. Imagine uh, I adjust my, uh, the waterfall uh, on my tap at a low setting, then I have a nice laminar flow. If I increase the, uh, the, the flow rate, I'll get a turbulent behavior. But then for entire range in between, you get uh, what you see in the picture, kind of uh, the dynamic stays in one regime, then switches to another regime, stays in the other regime for a while, then switches back, okay? So basically it's kind of a, a, a known phenomenon in physics that when you transition to, uh, to chaos, there is this uh, dynamical range where you see this uh, intermittent uh, behavior. And I think the analog in our case is that kind of the ordered phase is the evolutionary stable state. And then we have this chaotic rapid turnover phase and we see this intermittency in between. So that's one way uh, to think about it. Kind of another parallel one can make, with, um, can make is with phase coexistence in physics. So, so uh, imagine you start with vapor and then you start compressing it down at constant temperature, it will eventually turn into liquid, right? But there is this entire finite size regime where both the liquid and the vapor will coexist with each other. And I think uh, uh, this is what we have here. We have a rapid uh, uh, one phase. We have another kind of uh, equal, uh, equal, equal phase, yeah? One, uh, there seems to be one Oh, the DD guy? Yeah, yeah, so, so basically this, uh, uh, these brown guys, they appear occasionally in this chaotic phase, okay? But they don't start this uh, intermittency, but uh, once you're in the rapid, uh, yeah, the random phase, sometimes you get this. The, uh, these brown guys are double antibiotic producers, actually, okay? So uh, anyway, we have the rapid turnover phase, we have the uh, evolution stable state, and we have this, uh, I think the intermittency is just the phase coexistence between the two, um, okay? Uh, we can uh, also think about uh, it in uh, actual biological terms. So when you look at these long persistent communities, you can see that they're ecologically stable, but they're not evolutionally stable. So mutations exist that can collapse these communities. Single mutations can come up and collapse these communities. So why do they persist for so, such a long time? Sometimes tens of thousands of generations, yeah? Yeah. Very, very good, yeah. Uh, uh, so so it's, it's temporal uh, coexistence, and the reason we don't see spatial, like a simultaneous coexistence is because at the end of every cycle we destroy all of spatial structure uh, completely, okay? But I think if we have an extended, if maybe we don't have the computational power right now, but if we, if we had it, had a big spatial simulation, it's conceivable, and I might be wrong, but there will be one region which will be in the, uh, kind of nice five species community phase. There will be another region over there that will be uh, rapidly fluctuating. Okay. Um, not exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, because I showed you there is a single evolutionary stable state. There is a single type of community that can uh, snap together and persist for a long time. So that's why you always see the same thing. Okay. So. Uh, uh, these communities are ecological, uh, ecologically stable. They are not evolutionally stable. Why do they persist for such a long period? It turns out that the mutations that collapse them, they are, they are always very close to existing phenotypes. So here are the five species, the, the five strains. And there's some mutants that collapse, but they are very close. You have to zoom in to, uh, 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 to see them. And because they're very close to residents, their selection coefficients are very tiny, okay? Because the selection coefficients are tiny, they're almost neutral mutations. They're very, uh, it's very hard for them to escape uh, stochastic loss initially. Even if they escape stochastic loss, 
it will take very long time for them to invade. Even if they increase in frequency, they'll stabilize the community only very weakly. It will take uh, uh, hundreds of generations. So all these things accumulate, and that's what uh, kind of is the proximate cause for this uh, intermittency. But there is a very simple, intuitive uh, way of thinking about that. If you're in the rapid, chaotic phase, there are all the time big, unexploited ecological opportunities, so the selection coefficients are huge. Once somehow uh, five species community forms, it kind of it almost exhausts all the ecological opportunities there, and, and there might be some, uh, 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 some beneficial mutations that might arise, but, uh, 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 but these opportunities are, uh, are not strongly selected for. Okay, so, the, so, so this exhaustion uh, of ecological opportunity slows down the, the evolutionary dynamics. All right, and kind of uh, my favorite picture, and I have slides later to show you that is like the rapid emergence of evolutionary stable state corresponds to this funneling dynamics. So if you think of uh, this bow as the state of uh, the system, and this is kind of the ecologically stable communities, once an ecologically stable community forms in this regime, it's kind of funneled down to the evolutionary stable state. Intermittency is the same thing, but the funnel is up and down at the bottom. So basically the ball goes into the funnel, spends a lot of time there, drops back, and it keeps doing that. It's kind of related to uh, mechanisms in physics, such as uh, uh, long-lived excitations. Let's say if you shine light on uh, phosphorus atoms, they absorb the light, but then they'll go to this uh, other state, and uh, the de excitation will be very, very slow. So you have this long, lift uh, loops. So there is like some randomness that excites the system, but then it's very slow to come back. All right, so this is uh, uh, physics. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I just uh, take five more minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, here's some experimental data. For, this is from Michael Desai lab with EAST, and this is kind of a analysis of uh, the long-term experiment by Richard, uh, Richard Lansky. And what this uh, uh, data shows is sometimes you have situations where you start in, in a simple one niche environment and then some ecological diversity emerges. Then it persists for a long time and then it collapses again. So this is, in this case, this is just two species, species diversity. But it kind of is reminiscent of this uh, 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 intermittency kind of in a much uh, uh, simplified uh, uh, context. So I'm hopeful that as we uh, analyze uh, as uh, we have more longer and longer time series data and richer data, we'll start seeing this phenomenon more. Okay, the final mechanism I wanted to point out, which is very interesting, is sometimes you see these long persistent communities, they can be more than five species, so six, seven species, that persist seemingly indefinitely. They look like an evolutionary stable state, but then you stop the mutation and then disappear. So how uh, that might be even possible? So this state here, multi-species state persist despite a barrage of mutations, but then you turn off all the mutations and then everything collapses. Well, it turns out that uh, what stabilizes these communities are loss of function mutations, which we kind of put into the system because we thought, oh, this is something that will happen biologically. So like producers sometimes will lose their production and go directly to being resistant, or so degrader will become sensitive or producer will become sensitive. All these loss of function mutations, the if, uh, if the corresponding source strains are uh, abundant, the, they'll kind of uh, add uh, almost deterministic correction to the ecological dynamics, and this dynamics turns out to be stabilizing. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not neutral, uh, uh, neutrally maintained community, because you have coexistence of strains that cannot be recreated by this loss of function mutations, okay? But, uh, uh, but their stability is maintained by the loss of function mutation. So we have this strange uh, persistence without ecological stability. Okay, and then we have some other modes. And kind of the final thing uh, I just wanted to, to mention, and I'll be very quick, is uh, that all these things that I, I told you, the emergence of a revolutionary stable state, all these uh, interesting uh, eco evil modes, they only work in the finite uh, mutation uh, limit, okay? If I, if, if I tune down the mutation rate alone, everything interesting in this model disappears. And what I mean by mu going to zero limit is that the limit where I introduce a change to the community, wait a very long time, wait, wait for the community to equilibrate, 
and only uh, then introduce the next mutation to the community, then wait for a very long time, uh, okay? And uh, we know that in practice, in for pretty much for every community, uh, it won't be the case, right? So you have many mutations ar arising uh, in the community, so once a mutation arises and kind of leads to some ecological transient, another mutation will also arise. So this is kind of the realistic uh, limit here. But kind of the strange thing is that almost always when we think about uh, evolutionary dynamics, we're implicitly in this one change at a time and let's wait and see what happens kind of mindset at least. This is how my thinking was, okay? So this is the reality of finite mutation rate. We see all these different things. In this uh, mu going to zero limit where mutations happen one at a time and we wait long intervals between them, the model is completely boring. Uh, and there's this disconnect between reality and how we, we think. And uh, really this captures the essence of eco-evolutionary dynamics, right? Ecology and evolution happen on the same time scales. If you bring the evolutionary time scale mutation rate way below what is reasonable, uh, things become boring. So this is an example of a model which is only interesting in the eco-evolution limit and then becomes boring uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, kind of, in the, kind of the traditional limit we have. And just to kind of uh, uh, make one final analogy and then I'm uh, done. Uh, what I was arguing on the si slide that skipped, that you can m m uh, make this uh, a good analogy is between mutation rate and temperature, okay? The mutation is what creates these fluctuations uh, in the system. Now, in physics, we talk about these states of matter. They're like uh, liquids, gases, crystals, uh, liquid crystals, plasma, glasses, you name it, many, many different states of matter. But many of these states of matter, let's say liquid, they only make sense at finite temperature. There is no such thing as liquid at, uh, in the zero temperature limit. I mean, there's superfluids, but that's a separate uh, state of matter, okay? So it's fundamentally impossible to think of liquids without fluctuations. Similarly, all these interesting things that I showed you, they don't exist in the small mutation limit, but that's because these evolutionary fluctuations are fundamental to their existence. And since this is uh, the re a realistic situation for the entire ecosystem, uh, mutations are not too rare, I think uh, that's where we need to focus on uh, to, to study eco-evolutionary dynamics. Okay, and uh, I'll just uh, summarize. We found emergence of diverse communities. Beyond that, we've identified all these interesting eco modes. That suggests that we need to go beyond classical notions of ecological stability, evolution stability, this one mutation at a time mindset when we think about evolution. Now, data sets, long-term data sets are still kind of, uh, there aren't uh, many, uh, very many of them. It's hard to do uh, ev uh, uh, experimental evolution. But one thing we can do right now that we are ready for is we have these powerful uh, computers. We can do this uh, uh, large-scale, multi-scale eco-evolution simulations. And, uh, and we can do a lot more of that in, in many different settings. Look at these eco-evo modes and see uh, if, if there is an infinite diversity of such modes or there are only like few that keep repeating. Okay, so uh, thank you.